All right, let's get started this morning. Oh, we already are. Okay. Well, it's good to be here. We've got some visitors. What a blessing. And everybody else that's here as well. We thank you for coming today. We've been studying about sin. Uh, if you remember last week, I had on the back of the board a whole list of sins, and we looked at sin. And I told you that I had a plan of kind of making this uh, go along with last week, and then next week as well, we'll go along with this week. So last week we talked about sin. Today we're going to talk about sinners. And we're going to look at seven types of sinners. It just turned out seven. When I got done with this, I go, are there seven of them? And sure enough, there was. I went through and studied and wrote those down. I'm like, wow, another seven. Can't get away from the number seven, can we? It's pretty incredible. So let's start out today in Romans chapter 3. And then we'll go to Romans 5 and then 1 Timothy 1. And we're going to be looking today at the seven types of sinners. And uh, last week was bad news. It's not fun to talk about sin, is it? Well, there'll be a little bit of bad news this week, too, because there are seven different types of sinners that I find in the Bible. And um, this is kind of like a progression, if you will, because there's the worst of sinners, and then they, they're not so bad and not so bad, and then you can go over here and you find a sinner that wants to be saved, that's ready to be saved. My dad used to say it like this, why don't people get saved? And I'd try to figure out the answer, and he'd go, wrong. And then I'd try something else, wrong. And he'd say, it's so simple. Why don't people get saved? I, I don't know, Dad, why? He goes, because they don't want to. <laughs> I mean, it's that simple, right? So you got to get them to the point to where they want to. And a lot of people nowadays are at such an extreme, not only do they say, I don't know if there's a God, they say, no, there is no God, and I hate you if you tell me there is. And they're full of hate against God in the Bible. Why? Why do they hate God so much? The answer is sin, <laughs> because they're sinners. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but you know we're all sinners. Yep. There's really only two types of sinners. Now you say, but this is called seven types of sinners. Well, there's really two types of sinners, a saved sinner and a lost sinner. Right. So I guess I should have put the seven types of lost sinners up here today, but that's what I'll be talking about, is those that aren't saved, what kind of sinners. Why am I talking about this? Because you're going to sure as the world meet someone like this, right. and I want to help you deal with them so that they can get saved. So next week's sermon is going to be on how to win souls to the Lord. And I want to go through and show you a lot of verses that I use when I'm dealing with somebody and how we try to win people to the Lord and what they need to see. But today I'm going to try to familiarize you with the different types of sinners. And then you'll know what you're dealing with. Oh, or is he an atheist? Oh, is he an agnostic? Oh, is he just a skeptic? Oh, is he one of these other ones here? This is the main one here in America. Now, maybe not the rest of the world. But in America, everybody says they're a Christian almost, almost. Now, there's a lot of atheists, but a lot of people say, hey, I'm a Christian. And they're just as lost as a golf ball in high weeds. They're not saved. They're religious, but they're lost. So let's get started. Romans chapter 3 and verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. Now skip down there to verse 23. For all have sinned. Do you see that? Three letters. A-L-L. -L. That's not the detergent <laughs> that you buy at the store. All. This means all people in the world. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So everyone is a sinner. Now that's the bad news. Now look at Romans 5.8. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Right. Who is Jesus trying to save? Sinners. Jesus died for you. He came to save sinners. Now turn over to 1 Timothy 1, 15, real quick. So the bad news is you're a sinner, but the good news is uh, if you're a sinner, that's the one that the Lord's trying to save. So you need to recognize that, don't you? You need to recognize you're a sinner. A lot of people in the world today, they don't even want to say they're a sinner. That's a shame. They won't even admit that. The first step is admitting your problem, right? I'm not, I don't go to AA or anything like that, but what is the first step? Admitting your problem. Uh, 1 Timothy 1, 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all. There's that word all again. You should study sometime in the Bible all the time that it says all. The Bible says Jesus died for all men. Did you know that? I, I couldn't become a Calvinist because I'd have to throw that word all out. I'm not a Calvinist. I believe he died for all, not just certain ones. Worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save who? Sinners, Sinners of whom I am chief. Yep. Amen. Y'all didn't know that Paul was an Indian, did you? He was a chief. <laughs> no, but he says he's the chiefest of sinners. He looked at himself as the worst sinner that ever lived. Yep. You ever look at yourself like that? That's right. When you do, you see just how bad you are and just how much you need Jesus. Yes. 
But the world today, they don't want to look at Jesus and they don't want to look at themselves and they don't want to look at sin. So they don't want to deal with the issue. The only pre, pre can't even say the word this morning. The only prerequisite to salvation is to know you're a sinner. Did you know that? Yep. Then you can realize your need to be saved. Let's go over to 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4 real quick. And I want to say this. And again, there's the word all. I just a lot of all in here today. But I've been dealing with this week is people that go around and say, well, Brother Breaker, you're wrong. You tell people they have to know something to get saved. Well, that's ridiculous. You don't have to know anything to get saved. And I look at them and go, you even read your Bible? There's something you need to know before you can get saved. What? The gospel. Yeah. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You've got to hear that preached in order to know what to put your faith in, what to believe in. So, yes, you've got to know something. Look what this says in 1 Timothy 2, 4 for all those guys who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the what? Knowledge. Of the truth. Amen. So before you can get saved, there's something you've got to know. <laughs> some guy told me, he said, you're going to make a good Calvinist because because. He said Calvinists teach some sort of order of salvation or something like that. Well, I did a video one time. I called it the order of salvation. And all I said was, you got to know before you can believe. I'm a Calvinist suddenly. <laughs> no, I'm not a Calvinist because I believe that word all. He died for all men. And you need to know you're a sinner and then know what the Bible says you're supposed to trust to be saved. You all agree with that? Amen. Bunch of Calvinists. I mean, I mean, come on. Well, that's what they call you. But what do we do when they call us names? We take the high ground and say, hey, we love you anyway. Amen. You're wrong and we'll see you at the judgment, but we love you and we hope you come over to the truth. But the Bible says all men to be saved. Now go back to uh, Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. We love them. I really do. And uh, I hope they get right. And uh, I tell you, one of my verses that I really like lately is that one that says, if a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Right. I just want to please the Lord. And if uh, someone's my enemy, I, I want them to be my friend. Mm -hmm. And uh, attacking them back will not help the situation. So showing love, that's the way to do it. So do that too. I, I want to encourage you to do that. Yep. I know that's hard. It's very hard. But you got to do that. It's the right thing to do. Amen. For Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. Who's that one man? Jesus. Adam. Adam. Yeah, Jesus is coming here in a minute. Yeah, at the end of the verse. But the first one's Adam. We could sure blame Adam for all our problems. But you know what? We're sinners too. Yeah. So you can't blame somebody else. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Yeah. Then later on, it talks about Jesus, and he's the one that brings eternal life. Verse 21. So, are you a sinner? Yes. Is there anyone in here with the raise their hand and say, no, Brother Breaker, I am not a sinner? Wow. So we're all sinners. You know, I've actually met people that told me, I'm not a sinner. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just went, um, well, then that was your first sin. You just lied. Because the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And all men are liars. So, yes, you're a sinner. Now, when we deal with lost people, there are all different types of lost sinners, and I want to look at them today. And you're going to run into these people. And when you want to win someone to the Lord, you want to win them to Jesus, you need to know what kind of person you're dealing with. Because some people are harder to win than others. If they're down here, they're easier to win. If they're up here, they're the hardest to win. And there's all sorts of arguments you can use to try to win them, but I want to just go to the Scriptures. And so there are people out there, let's look at the first one, that are called atheists. Now, what is an atheist? I put evolutionist because there's this teaching of evolution in the world today that makes people atheists. If you're an evolutionist, what are you saying? I don't believe in God. And everything came from nothing. And you just kind of scratch your head and go, what? I mean, how could something come from nothing? I'd love to do that. I'd love to just go like right here and say, now, a uh, gold bar. And there's a gold bar right there. I mean, that would be great. But I... That's impossible to make something out of nothing. That not that against the first law of thermodynamics or something like that? I mean, trust the science, right? How, how could you be an atheist if you believe in so-called science? Evolutionists claim to be scientists, but yet they're just teaching a theory. Yep. Isn't that what it's called, the theory of evolution? Right. Now, atheists say dogmatically, there is no God. They are very dogmatic about it. As I was looking up on, online, atheism and atheists, there was a term they used called a committed atheist. <laughs> it's like when you're an atheist, I'm committed to the fact that, and I'm thinking to myself, yeah, they ought to be committed, you know, to, to a, some, some, because it's really strange to say there is no God if you go out in the woods for a week 
Everywhere you look, you're like, man, this couldn't have been an accident. God must have made this. Look at that snake crawling through. Look at that. There's a lizard. Oh, wait, wait. There's a raccoon. What an odd animal. I mean, and you look at all this stuff, and that's just a great big accident? I don't think so. So I don't see how one person or a person can be an atheist. But they do not believe in God at all. Do you know God believes in them? Yes. You know, God knows that they're real and God believes in them. But how's the best way, how is the best way to deal with an atheist? Go to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. <laughs> Period. No, there is no God. Well, my book says in the beginning, God did it. No, he didn't. Yes, he did. Who are they arguing with? Really? God. But they say there's no God. Prove it. Okay. If you read the rest of the book, <clears throat> I've never met an atheist yet that read the whole Bible. But they sure are committed to their cause that there is no God. If you read this book, you know what you find? There is a genealogy from Adam to Jesus. 4,000 years of human history and genealogy. How do you deny that? Oh, well, that's just legends and, and falsehoods and, and made up. Man. But why does it say this guy lived this long and this guy begot this guy? And this That's a record of history. You can't deny that. So you are denying at your own peril the truth when you deny the Bible and deny God. Atheists say, no, there's no God, there's no God. Well, there's only four possibilities. So you want to use logic? Let's use logic on an atheist. There are only four possibilities of the creation of the universe and our existence here on earth. Only four possible possibilities. Number one, it's always been there. Now, how do you prove that? You know anybody that's 20 billion years old that can, that can say, yep, I was here, and it was here before me, so it's always been. I don't know anybody like that, do you? There's no way to prove. Now, isn't that what science is? Science is observation, something that you can reproduce in a laboratory and observe, all right? How do we know it's always been here? We don't. It came about accidentally. What do they teach? They teach the Big Bang. And you go to college and you pay big money and they say, we're going to teach you, don't oh, those stupid fundamental Christians, they're so dumb, they don't know anything, oh, they're idiots. And then I got a book that has the genealogy of man in it. Right. And, and they say, that we all came from a big bang and your uncle's a monkey. I mean, that's an insult to me, but that's what they say. And so you question that and you say, wait a minute, the big bang, what, what's the big bang? Well, everything in the world wasn't there and all of a sudden it just blew up and there it was. You should be committed, <laughs> basically, to an insane asylum because I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but you have to have something for something to blow up. You have to have an accelerant to start a fire. <laughs> but they say nothing exploded. Okay, look right here in my hand. Do you see what's right there? Nothing. <laughs> oh, it burned my eyelashes off. It, nothing just exploded. Doesn't that just sound stupid? How could any sane person believe that. Maybe they never thought it through. It's not here, it's just an illusion. You know, years ago a movie came out called Matrix. And in that movie we're all connected to some computer someplace and it's all an illusion. We're all in the metaverse or some silly stuff. And uh, it's just an illusion. We're not really here. Well, take your finger, okay? Pinch your butt cheek as hard as you can, all right? When you go, ow! you'll know you're here and you're not an illusion. You're a real person, right? So these three make no sense. The only logical conclusion is this must have come about supernaturally by a divine creator. That's the only logical conclusion for the existence of man. So they say, no, but there's no God. Well, then how did we get DNA, which is a code that someone must have coded? That's called intelligent design. That didn't come about by accident. There's no way that was a great big cosmic accident. And by the way, what if I said to you, you were an accident. Wouldn't you feel like insulted? <laughs> but yet you pay money to colleges, you send your kids, and they tell them you're just a great big accident and your daddy was an was a ape. I mean, what a sad thing. Should have gone to Sunday school and you probably would have learned more than most colleges, amen? So that's the, the thing. When it comes to atheists, atheists just are so opinionated, they don't want to even hear it. They've made up their mind, there is no God. Well, you know what God says about them? Let's go to Psalms chapter 14. God has their number, and uh, He knows who they are because He created this, and He knows who they are, where they are. He knows the very hairs of their head are numbered and all these things. What does God say about an atheist? 
Psalms chapter 14 and verse 1. Now, we've got a lot of scripture to go to today, but Psalms 14, 1 says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. <laughs> God's looking down from heaven. And he's going, really? There's no God? I'm up here. I heard every word. He goes, that's pretty foolish. Yeah. And they're going, well, you're foolish to believe in God. And God goes, I heard that. <laughs> hmm. But look at the rest of it. There is no God, they say. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. They're sinners. Why do you think they enjoy sin? Because they don't want to think there's a God that they have to give account to someday. And if I can just do away with God, then I do away with the judgment. Now I can go do whatever sin I want, and I don't have to feel bad about it because I'm just going to die. And that's the end of me. Survival of the fittest. I'm just... But the Bible says it's appointed on a man wants to, to die, and after this to what? judgment. So you will give account to God. Yeah. And according to the word of God, when they die, someday they'll go before God that they say they don't even believe. Yeah. Can you imagine? They're standing before God at the judgment. And they go, well, you're not real. I don't believe in you. And God's like, doesn't matter. Here I am. Yeah. What a sad thing. So I want to see atheists believe the truth. Amen. I want them to come to God. I want them to see what the Bible says. Go to Isaiah Oh, I think I wrote it down wrong, so let's skip that one. Let's go to Ephesians 3. I had Hosea 4 something. I think it's 40 something. So let's go to Ephesians 3, 9. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 9. The Bible says that Jesus Christ created all things. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 9. So they don't believe that. And what you have to do is you have to try to show them from the Bible, and they don't believe the Bible, then you can go to logic. But these are the ones that are the farthest from God and the hardest to win. Ephesians 3, 9 says, And to make all men, there's that word all again, see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Well, you have other people in the world that are sinners that say, well, I'm not an atheist, I'm just an agnostic. What does that mean, agnostic? Well, a or a sometimes means no, and gnostic comes from gnosis, which is knowledge. And so a person who's agnostic is saying, I just don't know. So they're really confessing to being stupid. <laughs> I'm just dumb on purpose and I don't want to know. Because you talk to an agnostic and say, well, would you like to know? No. <laughs> so you're literally confessing, you know, I'm dumb on the matter but I still want to be dumb and I enjoy being stupid and, and not wanting to know the truth. I'm not like that. I don't understand how a person could say, I don't know and I'm happy not knowing. Mm. I want to know. Yeah. Don't you want to know? Inquiring minds want to know. Remember that old commercial or something like that for that tabloid or whatever? So agnostic, what is an agnostic? Well, there are those who say, well, there might be a God, but I don't know. Okay, well, let's find out. Nah, I don't need to know. Yeah, you, you, you need to know. I looked up agnostic, what the internet definition of agnostic is, and it's a person who believes that nothing is known or can be known of the existence of God or of anything beyond material phenomena. A person who claims neither faith nor belief in God. So they choose to not choose. But isn't not choosing choosing? <laughs> because you choose not to accept. Uh, not accepting is rejecting. So there are sinners that are rejecting God and don't want to know anything about God. We don't have time to turn there, but in 1 Thessalonians 4, 5, he talks about those that know not God. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15. There are people out there that know not God. They don't know anything about God. And sadder still, they don't want to know about God. But just as sure as, as I'm standing here, something bad happens in their life. What's the first thing they do? Try to make sense of the thing. And they, usually they'll just say, oh, God, why'd you call on him first? Why'd you, why'd you say his name? Why were you thinking about him when you said you don't know anything about him? Well, the Bible says we have a conscience. You think maybe God put a conscience in you? And maybe that conscience is a light to lead you to God? You ever think about that? Uh, something bad happens, a mother dies, or they get in an accident, lose a loved one. Then they go, man, I, I think I need to look into this God thing. I hate it. Something bad has to happen before they want to come to God. But that's usually what happens. In 1 Corinthians 15, 34, look what it says here. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of what? God. I speak this to your shame. What a shameful thing to not know anything about God. Uh, America used to be a Christian nation. It used to be a nation that was founded on God and the Bible and the principles of this book. But nowadays, they've kicked God out 
and our nation is turning against the very thing that it was founded on. Yeah. And that's sad. And we have a nation full of people that have been secularly educated who are either atheist or agnostic. And they're sinners. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 1. When you kick God out, you're opening the door to sin. And society suffers for it. Yeah. Back in the 1700s, 1800s, the gospel had saturated the world through missionaries going all over. You know, the English um, empire, you know, sun never set on the English empire. Right. English missionaries going all over the world. And they said that, that if a man cussed in front of a child, he would blush because he felt bad about it. It's not like that nowadays, is it? See, the world is a better place when it's a Christian place because Christianity teaches morals. But atheism and agnosticism teaches there's no God, so why do we need morals? I'm going to go hurt this guy and steal from him and do this bad. And then society becomes a bad place. Is that the kind of society you want? Not me. Man, where you're afraid to leave your house? It's scary. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7 the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Right. What does God say about an agnostic? Man, you're, you're, you're kind of foolish not wanting to know more. Yeah. Right. Maybe you should look into this book. I've never met an agnostic yet that said he read the whole Bible. Nope. How is it you can be so against something you've never even read? Mm -hmm. I've met a lot of people that said I was an atheist and agnostic before I got saved, but then I read the Bible. Yep. That's right. What changed your mind? The fact that this is truth. So I would encourage you, if you're an atheist or an agnostic, read the whole Bible mm -hmm. and then get back to me. Amen. Okay? I dare you. I double dog dare you. Because this will change your life. Amen. What are you afraid of? Are you a coward? Are you a coward to get into this book and read it? What are you afraid of? Anyway, go to uh, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 29. Look at verse 29. For they that hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would none of my counsel, they despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. Yep. These are just an excuse to sin. Saying I'm an atheist or I'm an agnostic, all you're saying is I just want to sin and I don't want to think about God because that would make me feel bad about my sin because then I'd have to give account to him. So, so I just I choose to be these. I don't want to think about God. That's sad. You need to realize God is real. There is a God and he is real. Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Do you want wisdom? Do you want knowledge? Do you want to know? These guys go, no. I do. Knowledge is what? Power. It's good to know some things. Um, the more you know. When I was a kid, we watched G.I. Joe cartoons. <laughs> and what did they say? And knowing is half the battle. <laughs> okay, so yeah, I guess knowing is a good thing. Well, then you have these other guys. Now see kind of how this is a progression from the worst to not so bad. But you're going to come across these kind of people, and you need to know how to deal with them when you're trying to win them to Jesus. Here we have skeptics. What is a skeptic? Someone that says, well, I heard that, and, and I've studied that, but I'm still kind of on the fence. about. I, I wonder if that's right or not. That's a skeptic. They say, oh, I guess. I mean, I, I guess I believe there's a God who's a creator, but, but I don't know if the Bible's true. I'm just skeptical of all that jazz. That's a skeptic. But they don't need to be skeptical. They just need to read the Bible and believe it. We're over here in Proverbs chapter 3. Look what it says in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 through 7. When I was a little boy, I'd get up and, and eat breakfast every morning at the kitchen counter, and Mom had these verses right there. And I'd read this verse every morning on the wall, on this little plaque that she had. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lead not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes, fear the Lord, and depart from what? Evil. Evil. So when you come to the Lord and trust Him, you depart from evil. Yep. I think skeptics just want an excuse to sin, yep. right? They're using that as a crutch. <laughs> these people are using their sin as a crutch to not believe in God. Right. They're using these titles to say, I'm one of these, because they don't want to believe. And the Bible says we should trust. Is the Bible true? Yeah. Yes. But when you run into a skeptic, here's what you get. You've got a guy that goes, well... I don't know if the Bible's true, because man wrote that book. 
You hear them say that all the time. Man wrote that book. Man wrote that book. Man, you're half right. Man did write the book, but guess whose words he wrote down? God's words. Let's look at those verses. So it's not just man's word, it's God's word. 1 Thessalonians 2.13. So if there is a God, and a skeptic would probably say, yeah, there's probably a God. So you're getting closer to someone accepting that there is a God, but uh, they need to understand that God gave us a book. Amen. When you buy a car, do you get a book in that car called an owner's manual? Uh, yeah, I got my owner's manual when we bought our car. Um, so if a man makes a car and gives you a book on how to use it, why wouldn't God who created man give us a book to tell us who we are, where we came from, and, and all that good stuff? Amen. He did. Yep. It's called the Bible. And here we have in, uh, what verse did I tell you? 1 Thessalonians 2.13. A great verse to prove that you can use on someone that says they're a skeptic. I don't know if that Bible's true or I think man wrote that book. Look what it says. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Amen. The Bible says this is not the word of men, it's the word of God. Yep. But they say the opposite, so you need to be able to show them those verses. Let's look at another one real quick, 2 Peter 1.21. Do you know where these verses are in the Bible? 2 Peter 1.21, you should. You should have these memorized or marked in your Bible so that you deal with these sinners, you'll know what verses to show them. Okay? Are you with me? In uh, 2 Peter 1.21, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So they were moved by the Holy Ghost. He moved their lips, he spoke through them, and it was written down. So this is a book from God. Yep. But yet the Bible says in the last days there'll be a lot of skeptics. 2 Peter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 2 through 4. That you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. Those are your skeptics. Walking after their own lusts. You see, there's the problem. They want sin more than they want truth. You see that problem? And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all, there's that word, all again. Why does that keep coming back? All things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So your skeptics go around and they scoff and they make fun and they ridicule and they say, ah, I don't believe all that. Why? Because of sin. They love sin. That's why they're skeptical. Okay? Are you with me? Then we have another one. Let's go over to um, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8. This one would be your philosopher. A lot of people go off to college and that ruins them. They are not taught higher education. They are propagandized into believing against God in the Bible. And philosophy, what is philosophy? Philosophy, philo, that is love. And so, so, Sophia, Sophia means wisdom. So philosophy means lover of wisdom. Well, if you love wisdom, then you'd want to find true wisdom, wouldn't you? But the problem is, uh, they want the wisdom of men rather than the wisdom of God. Right. Now, who's smarter, God or men? God. God. So I want to know his wisdom. But many philosophers, they devote their time to reading books of men mm. and what men say about it. I don't care about what men say. I've said this before. I've got to say it again. They all have their opinions. And opinions are like armpits. Everybody has two and they all stink, right? I don't care about your opinion. I want to know what does God say? What is the truth? All right. But the Bible warns us about philosophy in Colossians chapter two and verse eight. And it says, beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of who? Men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Getting into philosophy, and that's great if you want to read philosophical books and all that stuff. You better be careful. You're reading men's words. You're not reading God's words. Where do you go to read the words of God? The Bible. Amen. Let's go over here to James chapter 3 and verse 15. Let me show you this. There's two types of wisdom in the Bible. And you've got to choose which one you want. And you can be a philosopher and you can be a skeptic. You could say I'm agnostic or atheist. And you can, you can choose to go your own way and think your own thing. But guess who is really the one planting the seed in your head? Well, let's read it. James chapter 3 and verse 15. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. Yep. So there's a true wisdom from God, and He is above in heaven. 
And then there's an earthly wisdom down here, men's wisdom. Look what it says, verse 16. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. Oh, that's sin. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. So you've got true wisdom from God, and you've got men's wisdom. And it says the devil plants the seed in that, because it's devilish. Wow. I don't want to be an atheist or agnostic or skeptic or one of these. I, I want Jesus and what he said, right. because he is absolute truth. Amen? A lot of your philosophers, they go around and they ask this question and they, and they try to portray themselves as very smart. You ever, and they get smug about it too. And their nose goes a little higher as they walk around. Have you ever noticed people that walk around like this? I'm like, I'm scared of them. I'm like, man, they're not going to sneeze on me, are they? I mean, I kind of, I'm glad they put those little things on the salad bar for people like that in case they <laughs> sneeze. You know what I mean? But uh, they walk around like that and they love to ask this question in philosophy. They ask the question, why are we here? And they go, hey, why are you think we're here? Why are we here? And, and people go, oh, I don't know. Well, let me tell you. And they talk for 12 hours and they don't tell you. I mean, all they know how to do is say big words and make you think they're smart and they don't give you the answer. What if I told you that I could tell you why we're here in three words or less? <laughs> what? Um, it's that simple. Revelation 4.11. For thy pleasure we were and are created. Yep. Why are we here? All right, I'm a philosopher right now. Why are we here? Why are we on this little mud ball or whatever? Oh, now the flat earthers are going to come out. What are we doing on this um, um, uh, under firmament earth here? <clears throat> uh, what are we doing in this, I was going to say planet. Well, I'm going to say it. What are we doing on this planet? Why are we here? Were we just one big cosmic accident? Why are we here? Because God put us here to please him. Amen. It's that simple. We don't have to write a book on it. We don't have to go to the library and look at the philosophy section. That's all men trying to explain away why we're here, and none of them has the right answer. And the right answer is three words or less, for his pleasure. Yep. We're here to please God. Are you doing that? If not, you're pleasing the flesh, and you're pleasing the devil, and you're a sinner. And you need to come to Jesus. All right, so we've got these. Now we come to the self-righteous. Oh, the self-righteous. These people say, I'm a good person. I'm not a sinner. Or they'll say, well, yeah, yeah, I'm a sinner, but... I'm not as bad as that guy over there. I'm pretty good. And, you know, I give to the poor and I do this. And, and I do such good that, well, I think God ought to accept me just the way I am. And if my good works outweigh my bad works, I think I'm going to go to heaven. That's a self-righteous person. What if your good works outweigh your bad works? All that means is that you did better than others down here. But what about all the bad works you already did? That's what's keeping you out of heaven. And you can't undo them once they're done. And you can't pay penance for it to get them erased. Right. That's only through the blood of Jesus that they're washed away. So a self-righteous person, though, they will justify any sin. They will in their mind say, oh, I know that's wrong, but there's got to be a, a way that I could do it. And it would be for a good reason and that it's not wrong anymore. No, it's still wrong. That's called the greater good. You ever heard that? Well, you know, this is wrong. But if we do it for the greater good, philosophers say, then it would be OK. It's still sin. All right. So who are the self-righteous? What's the deal with the self-righteous? Let's go to Psalms chapter 51. The self-righteous are trusting in themselves rather than God. At least they know the difference between right and wrong, many of them. <laughs> so they're a little ahead of the game. They're not up here, atheists and agnostics. They're, at least they know right and wrong, but they don't know salvation. Right. Psalms chapter 51, verse 5. Look what it says. My righteousness is near. My salvation is gone forth. I'm in Isaiah. Yeah, thank you. Psalms, let me find this. That was a good verse too. I should have read it. <laughs> Psalms 51 and verse 5. Psalms 51 and verse 5. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. A lot of your self-righteous, they puff themselves up with pride and go, no, 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 I, I'm not sinning. I'm not a sinner. I'm so good now that I have achieved sinlessness and I no longer sin. That's a self-righteous. No, David, one of the greatest men, said, no, I was born into sin. <laughs> I was conceived in sin by a bunch of sinners. Uh, Psalms 53, 3. Every one of them has gone back. They are altogether become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. When you see these people that are self-righteous, you know what they think? They're that kind of people that, and I've heard this my whole life, but I'm going to clean it up. They're that kind of people that think their you-know-what doesn't stink. 
because they think they're so great and so good and I do such good and they're just so full of puffed up pride that they think they're better than you. Yeah. You ever met that sister better than you? <laughs> Brother, I'm better than you are guy. I, I don't like them, do you? They're self-righteous. God hates self-righteousness. It's not about you, it's about him. But they make it all about them, kind of like the rest of these guys do. <laughs> so look at uh, Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. Jeremiah 17, 9, God says he sees those people and he can look directly inside into their hearts. The heart is deceitful above all things. There's that word all again. How come we keep finding all? Huh? I didn't realize that when I was putting this together. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. God says your heart is desperately wicked. You might think you're so righteous and so holy, but you're not. You're wicked. You're a sinner. God doesn't want the self-righteous. He wants to impute his righteousness because your righteousness is no good. So are they saved if they're self-righteous? No, they're still sinners, but at least they're not atheists. At least they still believe in God. So they're coming down to or going down this way toward God, but they're still not saved. They're still sinners. Then we have those that are religious but lost. These were like the Pharisees of old. Yep. Jesus showed up to Israel in a time of apostasy. Mm -hmm. They really had turned from God and weren't keeping the law like they said they were going to. And guess what? They were the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were the religious leaders, and they were the wickedest of all the people. They say things like, well, I believe in God, and I do good things, so he can just accept me and, and what I do because I'm a good person and I do what the Bible says and they're not even saved. And they don't really even do what the Bible says. Now they do it outwardly so people can see, but inwardly, that's where their sin is. Envy, strife, hatred, division. They're religious, but lost. Nah, you never met anybody like that, right? Matthew chapter 15, verse eight and nine. These people oftentimes go to church every day of their life, but many of them are in a cult and they don't even realize it. What is a cult? The cult makes it all about you. A true church makes it all about Jesus. Amen. See the difference? It's not you because you can't save yourself. It's Jesus. He's the only one that can save. But look what he says here in verse 8, Matthew 15, 8, of these Pharisees. This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. With their mouth, I'm a Christian. I go to such and such church. I'm a Look how good I am. Oh, I love the Bible. I love it. But their heart is on all these other things. Right. On Sunday, they're a person that's completely different than the rest of the week. Mm -hmm. The rest of the week, they're at the bar or they're at home getting drunk. They're yelling and, and fighting and, and, and stealing. And, but they come to church on Sunday and they might even be a deacon. Mm. Hmm. Maybe even be a preacher. And they say, I'm a religious person. I follow the rituals and the rites of our religion. Here, let me give you this. Here, drink this. Here. And they, they do all that their religion tells them. And they're going to hell because they've never been saved. They're religious, but they're lost. And that's sad. And there's a lot of people in this world like that. And you've probably met some of them. They go to church. Let's look at what the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2. They go to church but they're not instructed in the way of salvation. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy 3. What is that? Well, I believe there's a difference between salvation and religion. Yep. Do you know the difference between religion and salvation? Religion is a system of works that a man thinks he has to do to please God mm -hmm. and to get into heaven. And the Bible says we're not saved by works. Nope. Salvation is what you receive when you quit trusting in yourself and your religion. And you say, Lord, I give up. I'm going to trust you. See the difference? So religious people are lost. And look what it says about them in 2 Timothy 3, 5. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Where's the power? What's the song we sing? There is power, power, wonder-working power in the what? Blood. Are they trusting in the blood of Jesus? No, a lot of them, they have a cup full of wine. And they say that wine is the blood. Are you serious? <laughs> How can wine? Nuh-uh, nuh, -uh, nuh -uh. And they try to drink that in their mess every week. They do what they call the Roman Catholic ma ma mess. Am I saying that right? M ma mass. The Ro okay, sorry. The Roman Catholic mass. I wasn't too far off. You know, in the military, you have mess, mess hall. But anyway, it says there, uh, 
having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Hmm. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with what? Sins, led away with diverse lusts. Some of the biggest sinners in the world are religious people. Now, I don't know. I hope we don't have any children in here. But I remember in high school, the boys talking in the locker room. I remember them saying, hey, you want to get a woman and get in bed with her? Get a Catholic or a Pentecostal because they're the easiest to get in bed with. The religious ones. Isn't that something? You would think the religious ones would say no. No, they're the ones that were the most sinful. Isn't that interesting? Why? Because they weren't saved. And because their religion taught, well, maybe I'll do that on Friday, but if I go on Sunday and they do this for me, and then I get my sin forgiven. No, you don't. It's not, man can't forgive your sin. Only Jesus can. I'm sorry. I didn't want to be crude, but I, wanted to, I want to give you real, real truth today, right? I want you to know uh, some, some of the way the world works, right? Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. There it is again. Something you've got to know before you can be saved. And it continues there. Uh, now is Janus and Jambres. Let's see. I wanted to read down to verse 9. Janus and Jambres withstood Moses. So do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. They're sinners. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men. There's that word all again. Man, I don't know why that keeps coming up. Lord, you trying to show us something? Is your sermon on all today, brother? Maybe, I don't know. But uh, as theirs also was. So sinners that need to be saved. They're so close. They go to a church that probably talks about Jesus, but they're not trusting in Jesus. They're so close to getting saved, but a lot of them are in a cult because their religion is telling them to trust themselves and their works and their church instead of Jesus. Well, the last one here is the humble sinner who realizes, man, I know there's a God. I want to know more. I'm no longer skeptical. No, forget man. Forget myself. Forget religion. I just want to go to heaven. I'm done. What is the truth? Those are the easiest ones to lead yeah. to the Lord because now they're seeking. And you know, the Bible talks about those that seek him. Go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. You get to the end here and you find, hey, I've, I've gone through all that and now I'm just like, no, I want salvation. I want the truth. Lord, help. Yeah. Look what God says in Hebrews 11, 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. Now remember, salvation's by faith. Amen? Amen. Not of works. It's believing. Believing is receiving. We're saved by trusting, by faith. Faith in what? Romans 3, 25, faith in the blood. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You've got sinners out there that are really seeking God. They want to know salvation. And many of them are stuck in a church that's lying to them and giving them false hope. What they need is to hear the gospel. And what we'll look at next week is verses we can use to win them to the Lord. These are the ones we're looking for. Maybe these we can't lead to the Lord, but we can sure plant a seed. Yeah. If we know the verses, we can give them a good verse that they stuck in their head they can't get out of. We want them to come down to this point to where they're like, you know, tell me, how do I get saved? Yeah. And then you can tell them. Acts chapter 17, verse 27, we don't have time to look there, but it talks about those that seek the Lord. And then happily they may, they may find him. Uh, Acts 4.12, salvation is only through Jesus Christ. There's no other name given under heaven whereby ye must be saved. And then Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25. Hebrews 7, 25. Do you realize that there's salvation only in Jesus Christ? Religion has salvation in other ways. That's not what the Bible says. There is a way that seemeth right in a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. There's only one way to heaven. Jesus Christ said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Yeah. Only one way to heaven, and that's Jesus. Not religion. Not your self-righteousness, self-sacrifice. No philosopher, skepticism, agnosticism, atheism. None of that can get you to heaven. Right. You've got to come as a humble sinner before God Amen. and realize, man, I'm lost. Mm -hmm. And I can't save myself. That's why Jesus is called the Savior. Yeah because only He can save you. All these people trying to save themselves, it's so sad. You'll never save yourself, that's why you need to save Him. I've looked at it like this, it's like being in the middle of the ocean, the very middle of the ocean, in a rowboat, and it's sinking. And you're doing this, dumping water out. And here comes a big used cruise liner, like, hey, can we help you? No thanks, I can save myself. 
good luck with that. There's going to come a time when you're so tired you can't do that and you'll fall asleep and you'll wake up in a shark's mouth because you cannot save yourself. You better take the ark. <laughs> you better take Jesus. He's there to save you. Amen? So Hebrews 7.25, speaking of Jesus Christ, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. God cannot wait to save you. So if you're watching this and you're here today and you're lost, which one of these are you? I hope you're that one, and I hope today you get saved. Amen. Maybe you're online watching this. Are you one of these? Can I give you a challenge to read the Bible for yourself? Amen. Too many people in this world are listening to others and following what others say. A lot of times they, they listen to religious leaders and what they say, and they're wrong. A lot of times they listen to political leaders and what they say, and they're wrong. A lot of times they listen to educators, and they're wrong. Yep. Why don't you listen to the Bible? I don't understand why. So are you saved? We'll look at that more next week. We'll go into some more verses on that. I want you to be able to win people to the Lord. I want you to know how. The best thing is to carry the Bible with you and to show them scriptures from the Bible. But you need to be able to recognize who are you dealing with. If you're dealing with the first two, those are some of the hardest ones. And you're not going to win them to the Lord in five minutes. Nope. <laughs> um, the other ones are hard, too. And it's hard to win. I think it takes at least 30 minutes to an hour nowadays to win people to the Lord. Yeah. I get so tired of these people that say they're soul winners. I think they're soul wieners. <laughs> because they go around saying, I got a guy saved in two minutes or less. And I'm like, is that? I mean... Most people are so brainwashed in a false religion, it's like a deprogramming session. You have to talk them out of the falseness that they believe before you can talk them into what the Bible says. It's getting harder and harder to win people to Jesus. And we have religious people out there going around just saying, one, two, three, repeat after me. And then now you're saved because you did it. And then the person goes, well, I don't know if I'm saved. Well, do it again. Pray it over. You know, I've had people say, I've been saved 17 times because I said the prayer 17 times. I'm like, dude, you don't get it. It's Jesus that saves you. Trust Him. You know, don't trust in something you do. I'm not against prayer. You can pray and you can get saved when you pray, but it's not the prayer that saves you. Right, right. Don't trust the prayer. Trust the propitiation. Yep. Trust Amen. Jesus. Don't Amen. trust what you said. Trust the blood He shed. Amen. That's what salvation is. Amen. All right, we need to close today because we need to get out of here. One question, two questions quickly. If anybody had a question or anything. Good, good. Okay, we can get started early today. And uh, please, if you do have some later, feel free to ask us. Brother Mike's going to end right at 12 because they have an event here today. And um, they need to get here on time and do their event. So we're going to close right at 12. So looking forward to that. And online, if you're in the uh, Pensacola area, we're in the Molino Chapel in Molino, Florida. We'd love you to come here. We still have one or two seats left, I guess, but we'd love to have you come and visit with us. Thank you guys for coming as well. All right, we'll see you next week. God bless. Amen.